Okay. So let's go to the next one. I think there's even one more. Yeah, that's one I was saying. That's the inside of it. Boy, that thing had a lot of green egg, uh, a lot yeah. of glass area. Well, that was SEO 14 from Piper. They, they, they sell it to the military, they put in more windows. Yeah. The best thing about them is that fuel gauge right there on both, the one for each tank. Yeah. That's one you can't fool there. It's non mechanical, it's just directly that's, into that's the tank. Right. It's the real fuel. Comes yeah. in that line right there. Goes out that one. It's, it's if it shows right there, that's fuel. <laughs> yeah. No failure points in that system. That's right. <laughs> Except maybe the fuel thing leaks. <laughs> well, if it's disassembled in there, you can't explain that. Uh, this side panel here is not typical Supergo. This is this is L fourteen B, which was sold originally in hundred or so of were sold to the Italian Air Force. So when we got in all these side panels and everything had Italian labels and everything on the switches, so I changed this panel, put a new panel in there, and made these panels and put in there, and labeled America. What are those panels? Radios? Yeah, master switch, I think. Is okay. I There's a master switch right there. And those are probably radios. I can't remember now. It's funny, I've forgotten how to... I could, it's been a while. How, but, well, what would that thing cruise at? Well, that's a matter of opinion. Super Cubs generally are listed as cruising at 125. We cruise this one at 110. It's barely over 100. Hmm. It's a high drag airplane, and we just have a 150 engine. The 180 takes gives more power, and you can run it at full RPM if you want to, and you can get 125, 135, maybe 145. If you don't have the big wheels, if you got the big those big fat tires on it, forget it. Huh? Yeah, you, you never get more than about 120. They are really draggy. That's my airspeed that I put in there. Is a line coming in there? Mm -hmm. I, Plumbed that in, tied into the regular airspeed down here, so I could sit in the back seat and see the airspeed right over the, this corner, the shoulder right here. Josh, I'm pointing down here, but I'm trying to think. Josh's shoulder comes up about right there. That's me. Oh yeah. Josh comes up there, and I had to have that thing up high so I could see it over his shoulder. We were flying. We were making all our approaches when I was getting him checked out and good at 40. If we ever got to 45, we were cruising in. <laughs> so I, I had to I had to watch that airspeed. That's so I got a glider airspeed that's very sensitive to put up there, so I could see 41 and 42 real close there. Mm -hmm. But I have to give Josh credit. He he never scared me. He could he watched that airspeed good too and flew good. He had very he and Wallace both amazing in one particular sense. Both of them were scared of flying. To what degree I'd be hesitant to say, because I've flown with both of them hundreds, almost thousands of hours, so they fly a lot, particularly with me. Neither one of them fly very much by themselves, and both mm -hmm. of them are truthfully scared of something, I don't know what. Just Wallace, I, was, I felt, was always uncertain of his own ability, and yet he was just, he was, he and Josh both were just so good. If, if like with Josh, I never, Wallace never did go to the trouble to learn to fly instruments, but Josh didn't want to learn to fly instruments. You just show him one thing and he, he can do it right away, no problem. Mm -hmm. And he, he could do all, all kinds. Josh is good on the radio, Wallace was passable. Maybe you were their feather like Dumbo, they could fly with a feather. <laughs> well, that's what Josh always called me, his, 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 uh, his net. He would introduce me to people going around the country and say, this is my net. <laughs> Your safety net, huh? Yeah. But uh, which I, I didn't appreciate. I, I worked on them, both of them, until they, they could fly better than 99% of the people. But uh, they just never got to the point they really, I'm, I'm imagining now, got to the point where they by themselves really wanted to go out and fly a whole lot or go places. Neither one of them would go a lot on long trips or anything. Unless I was with them, but they had the full knowledge and capability to do it. They just, they just didn't do it. They couldn't convince themselves, which I worked on because it was a concern to me. Because I, I knew that even though they had the skill of flying and the knowledge, they still had to have some confidence somewhere. So I worked on as hard as I could. 
never felt like I succeeded with either one of them. But I spent an awful lot of time with them. I don't know how much I would, mm -hmm. I'd say between the two, I bet at least 5,000 hours. Well, is Wallace flying without you now? Yeah. So not, not without somebody though. Oh. <laughs> He's flying with Lee. Uh, oh, okay. After I left, Lee Lee is, is the the biplane rides guy, and uh, he has a 172 that he does aero photography in, in addition to the biplane rides. And he gets Wallace to go and fly the airplane, and he gets the baggage bar and opens the baggage door in the 172 and takes his pictures out of there. Hmm. Wallace just lean over a little bit to that side. Yeah. That way he didn't have to cut a hole in the floor. Uh -huh. Normal air photography, you think of cutting a hole in a vertical camera, but those are very expensive cameras to, to yeah. use like that. But they do take wonderful aerial yeah. vertical pictures, you know, but that's not what Lee sells. He, he sells obliques, I guess you'd call them, and, uh -huh. and uh, that sort of thing. He can get a vertical by rolling the airplane over and straight down occasionally, but he can't do that by himself. So Wallace goes with him and gets a lot of flying. Yeah. And I think Wallace. I know Wallace depends, trusts him a great deal. Mm -hmm. I did a, after I'd been flying with Lee for a while, and he got a job flying Air Commander, corporate Air Commander, and after a year or two, his company boss wanted hey, somebody to fly with him and, and sort of give him a check ride to see if he was doing everything that could possibly be done to be good and safe and proper. Mm -hmm. And so, Lee asked me if I would do that for him, and I said sure. So I suited up, and went for a day trip with him in that commander, and I wrote his letter, boss a letter. After that, I said, "There's no, I cannot. This is the first time I've ever been able to critique a flyer like that and not have something to say. But I cannot say one single thing about flying, skill of flying, knowledge, handling the passengers, being prepared, anything you can name. Hmm. Lee covered it all. He just did it perfect." Well, I got some. Uh, I got a good package. I think I showed you last time from Wallace of uh, pictures uh, and some kind words about you. So there, most of the, I just got an email actually yesterday from uh, Reed. Ron Reed. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, he said he was he had moved and he couldn't find his pictures, but he did send me uh, a little comments about you about you guys' time together. What I need to get from these guys is uh, I'm going to have to contact a few of them back because I don't have pictures of them. I'd like to include pictures of them. Wallace, I've got a picture of you and him together. That's good. That's perfect. Yeah, Wallace is, is a hard, ardent photo photographer. Uh -huh. Worked in a camera shop for a while when he was young, that sort of thing. And his wife is too, so they've always done it together. So he's always supplied lots of pictures for things for me. After I had a I had a movie camera when my children first started coming along, and I gave that up. So after that, Wallace always supplied pictures for me, and for the model club too. Yeah, pretty much like you're doing. I spent the last uh, last Saturday, second Saturday, a, lot, a couple hours with uh, Noel Proctor. He's a 747 pilot. And he flies from L.A. to Australia. Yeah, I remember. And uh, he. Uh, had lunch with him uh, there and stuff and was visiting with him and he had taken some real good pictures with his iPad which is a great big old thing like this you hold up but anyway um, he said he was actually trained as a photographer he, that's what he was going to be and he went to school to be a photographer ended up being a pilot but uh, I'm gonna try to deploy him to help me get some pictures over there at WAM on different events It'd be good to have him he knows both the airplanes and the how to take pictures, so that's good. Another helper. Yeah, he's a, he's a pretty enthusiastic person. I remember him. Yeah. Okay, what do we got next there? This is my second Apache. No, this is the first one. I'm sorry, that's John's in front there. I was looking at it. Okay, yours is in back, huh? Mine's in back back there. This is when we... <coughs> Wallace and I were putting the rear window kit, we got from Seguin, into it up at John's hangar in Cartersville. So we had the holes cut the few slides to put the windows in there to cover the tarp there. In the meantime, while we were doing that, John decided he wanted to patch it, so he went out and bought one. 
When the airline pilot paid, you didn't have trouble doing that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that one really not yours. Let's go on to the next one. Okay. That's there. the very glider that there's we were talking about. That's the Minamoa, that's right. That's the Minamoa, and that's John Carlick right there. I'm trying to think. Chillahowie. Chillahowie is the name of this field. This is up almost at Chattanooga, about 90 miles north of Atlanta. And it's a glider field. That, that's all it did there was gliders. Mm -hmm. And they used to, all of us around Atlanta used to go up there a whole lot. There's John and the Minamoa on approach there. This is a 222. I don't know what this one is. Now, is this about the time you were setting the uh, Georgia distance record? No. Or was this way earlier? No, yeah, that was, that was way earlier. Okay. That was... Uh, 1940, 19, 1960, I would say, I've forgotten exactly, right about 1960 when I, I set that distance record, mm -hmm. and this was way up in the 80s. Okay. And that's my Jetstar. I actually sold it to Amway. They repainted it. So, that's what I said there. Now, did you own that Jetstar? Not personally, no. Okay. My boss, I, I went to work for the guy okay. who owned it. I, I felt like I owned it. Yeah. When he bought it, he wrote a, a check for $1 million, and I presented that. To, he handed that to me, and I presented it to Lockheed. Yeah. And when we sold it to Amway, I delivered it up to Michigan, to Amway, and Got in there and they gave me a check for a million something. I can't remember, remember two or a million two, something like that. Uh -huh. I took that home and gave it to the boss again. It wasn't, wasn't my airplane in that sense, money wise, but. Yeah. Uh, but you got a lot of hours in it, huh? Oh, yeah, a lot of hours. That was, that was my full time job for three and a half years, nearly four years. So I got very familiar with that, enjoyed that. Uh, mostly in the United States or out, outside overseas sometimes or what? We went, went overseas one now and then, went to Mexico sometimes. Uh -huh. Not too much. Thank goodness he didn't like to go travel. I didn't like to go overseas. Yeah. And he, his, I remember when I first went to work for him, he, he said, my purpose in buying this airplane is so I can have the airplane near me if I'm away from home. Uh -huh. And if one of my children has a problem, I want to get my airplane, go straight home. I don't have to go to the big airport and get a ticket. I want to go. <laughs> so, about how often would you fly that in terms of months? Maybe two or three times a month or something like that? Or? Oh, well, probably, probably ten times a month. Okay. On average. Yeah. But the usual trips were quite short, like from from Tulsa to St. Louis, which is an hour, mm -hmm. or from Tulsa to New York, which is about two hours and ten minutes. And to Kansas City and places, you know, not not too far away down in Texas, Dallas frequently. Yeah. My boss was among us. He, most of his money was, was just his own money. But he was also into a lot of other little businesses. He had a he owned Ridgeway Tools, you know that name? Sounds familiar. They they still own the market. Rigid rigid, not Ridgeway, rigid tools. Oh yeah. I've That's heard of that. They were at that time. They were t told to be the best best tools you could buy. I don't know whether they still are or not. But he, his wife's family had owned that company, started that company, and when he married her, he inherited the company. And so he owned that. And he was also chairman of the board of Emerson Electric, which is a pretty big company in St. Louis. That's why we went there so much. I remember one time when the fuel shortage came on, they were sending out bulletins to all the jet pilots to. Fly slow and conserve fuel. And one morning after that started, I, he came to the airplane ready to go to his board meeting in, in Chicago, in, in St. Louis, where I knew it started at 9 o'clock and we had just planned to get there, you know. And so he came to the airplane and I was telling him about this fuel thing and he said, uh, 
I said, you know, they got this rest out that all of us fly slow and conserve fuel. And he said, well, don't you worry about that. I said, I got my own fuel farm. <laughs> I got all the fuel I need. You just go as fast as you want to any time. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't have any problem with the fuel shortage those days. Did you ever have any uh, harrowing experiences or in this, unusual circumstances in, with in that this one? airplane? Yeah, or any of, well. No, I, nothing unusual happened. Well, they say, yeah, I did the egg, I think of one. Sure enough, it, but I was going to say I was pretty careful with this airplane. I was pretty careful, but I was making an approach into Chicago air one night in real bad weather, and uh, people were missing approaches and everything, but my, my me and my co-pilot were careful and eased in there and, and got a, got a pro ILS into, I think, to a runway. I don't remember the numbers there, but something to the northeast. We were headed somewhere around 60, 50 degrees to the northeast. And um, the dead broke out. We kept going lower and lower. And the I was anticipating going around, really, because other people had been going around. But we kept going to see how far low we could go. And I got down to just right at minimum. I was just about to go around. And um, we broke out, just, just barely broke out into a fuzzy view of the runway, and just as I saw the runway, I saw dead center in the runway, looking, you know, the width of the runway ahead of you, right in front of you, and right in the middle of that, up high, was a red flashing beacon light. This red flashing, at first I recognized a beacon light, and I jumped on the power just like fast as I could, and pulled up straight over, and when I went over, there was a 747 sitting in the middle of the runway, on the approach runway there. Ground control tower had made a mistake and let him get out there and let us make the approach with him sitting there. Wow. Boy, I didn't miss that one, but but a few feet, I'd say 20 or 30 feet at the most, I don't know, but it was it was sure a touchy place. If I hadn't seen it as quick as I did, we'd have been right going right through it. So that was a pretty close call in that airplane. But I'm not thinking a minute running over the rest of them. I don't I don't think I ever had any other Close calls in that airplane. Let's see, that one in New Jersey, that was with Texaco airplane, that wasn't this one. And uh, that was Lockheed airplane. I'm thinking some other close calls, but not with this airplane. I believe that's the only one. I guess it, it's kind of a joke, but the closest thing to a close call was one time I was carrying a whole family out to San Francisco and the son, Tony, who I later, when he got to be another year older, I taught him to fly. He bought a, a beach, uh, not a Sierra, but a fixed gear Sierra. What do you call it? I can't remember the name of it. Four place beach, low wing. He bought one of those, and I taught him to fly there at Tulsa. He did fine. But anyhow, Tony was there, and of course, there's Mr. and Mrs. Freitas, and uh, Tony was a pretty big joker, and uh, we were getting close to San Francisco and starting to let down. Tony came up to the cockpit and he was sitting there watching. And he reached over and grabbed the mic. And his mother was always wanting somebody on the mic to tell her what was going on, keep her informed. She just liked to know what was going on and what we're doing. He picked up the mic and started saying, well, hello, the passengers and all this. And this is your captain speaking. And we're now beginning our descent into New York, which was a long way from where we were, or intended to be, and supposed to be, you know. And he carried that on for a couple of minutes and then disappeared in the cockpit. And he hadn't gone long until his mother came up and said, what's going on? <laughs> I said, that was your bright son back there, not me. So she gave you, she didn't get on me. <laughs> that was the closest, most difficult, I guess, I had to that airplane. <laughs> that seems pretty mild. That was pretty mild, yeah. <laughs> I can remember one time coming out of New York that we ran into one of those long east-west fronts from Texas to New York. They run northeast, southwest right. in the spring, and the thunderstorms were building up along that line way up higher than we could go. We came out of New York and we started to go south along that line, and obviously we're not gaining anything to the west enough to go where we want to go. We're going to end up passing to the east. so. I kept 
looking, we had good radar, and I was looking along, and I finally saw a little little gap in the turn, and went through just perfectly clear, smooth air without a bump, straight through, with about 50 feet off the wing, it seemed like, big thunderstorms, and got through there, and uh, turned back along the other side, and went on down to us without a, a bump in the air, just, just a good, <laughs> a good way to, to get the best out of a good airplane, I guess you can say about that yeah. story. I remember another time coming out of Dallas with Mr. Fraser's younger brother on board. We faced the same kind of east-west thunderstorm line, and we were out of Dallas, so we were just headed straight for it and get going, and there wasn't any way to go. It was going east-west, and we were going north. So we were headed for it, there wasn't any choice. And got, I just kept going because I figured the closer I got, the better I had a chance to see a, uh, on radar to see an opening, mm -hmm. a light place through the clouds. And uh, Rex Fraser was his name. So Mr. Fraser's brother, and uh, he he was he was up there. He he was looking out there. He was a nervous type. He had a Learjet of his own. I don't blame him for being nervous, but uh, he was up watching. And uh, as I got closer, and closer, I kept going straight forward. I was looking for a place to go through, you know. And I guess he thought I was just heading for it, and I wasn't <laughs> saying anything, you know. And he, he finally tapped me on the shoulder and said, "You know, we're not in a hurry to get home." Something like. <laughs> Don't need to go through that. I said, don't worry, we'll find a place through. Yeah. But he didn't really want to go through that bunch of clouds. Yeah. He wasn't he wasn't near a good a flyer as his brother, older brother. Mister, hmm. my Mister Freitas, name was Joe Freitas. J F. That was the number of the airplane. Was one five seven J F. What 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 did their company do? Uh, one thing they did was large developments away from towns of second home things all over uh -huh. Arkansas and and uh, out west a couple of places and then Spain. Huh. But he, he was just basically, I, I, I think his original family money came from some kind of oil interest in, in Oklahoma. Oh yeah, Tulsa. And he never did talk about it much. 